Uh, welcome again. Um, we've had, clearly, uh, as everyone knows, we've had several weeks of very good news. Um, but I want to begin today with um, some realism. Um, on Wednesday this week, the World Health Organization reported 106,000 uh, new known reported cases worldwide, which was the largest number on any given day uh, since the pandemic began. And yesterday in the UK, 338 people died from COVID-19 and a further 2,615 uh, new cases were recorded. So when we say, as we have repeatedly, we cannot be complacent, that's why. Uh, and when we say we're not out of the woods, um, that is why. Uh, this infection remains, um, as I'm sure Dr. Brink will confirm, a very, very real threat around the world, and it therefore remains a very, very real threat to our community here in the Bailiwick. Um, I, so for that reason, I want to emphasize how incredibly important it is that every member of our community continues to be vigilant for signs of COVID-19 in themselves and in members of their household. We all need to know what symptoms to look out for. Um, and as a reminder, uh, the list is quite extensive. Um, it's a muscle ache, a fatigue and exhaustion, a headache, sinus pain, pain around the eyes, a loss of taste and smell, a sore throat, a fever, high temperature or chills, and of course the shortness of breath, chest tightness, or continuous new cough. So it's a whole range of things, and if you have any of those, um, Dr. Brink and her team want you to stay at home and contact the clinical helpline on 756938. And as we move uh, through the remaining phases, um, there is another issue which we want to emphasize today. Social distancing remains and will remain for uh, the foreseeable future really very important. As we go into the bank holiday weekend with uh, fine weather, uh, and as everyone starts to relax um, in the island about COVID-19, it will be very easy for any of us to forget. But we all do need to, to maintain our social distance uh, from each other, and, and that is going to continue for some time. Uh, we know, of course, that islanders have been watching statistics like Hawks daily and are waiting for the day that we do get to the magic zero known active cases. Um, and that will, of course, be a momentous day for us all. But, but we do need to prepare ourselves to see more positive cases occurring again in the future. And when that happens, we must not see that as failure. Actually, it will be a sign of success that our enhanced test programme that we've talked about that's, that's just begun and the test, trace, quarantine strategy, which we've, we've had from the beginning and, and has done us so well, is doing what it's supposed to do. In other words, it's identifying cases. So we've now had 22 consecutive days um, as of today with no new positive cases, and we're down to the only, the, uh, only having two known active cases. All the affected care homes are now all clear. Uh, and all this is very, very positive, and Deputy Salisbury will explain in a moment what this now means for business and the community. The final decisions will be taken next week, uh, assuming no substantial bad news emerges. I uh, also want to say I know how difficult it is for islanders to be separated from family uh, and loved ones who are, uh, who are off island. I and my family are, are feeling that too. And inevitably, as we head towards the summer and with today's announcements in a moment, islanders will inevitably speculate how long is it going to be before off-island travel is a possibility uh, without the need to self-isolate for 14 days on, on a return to the island. Now, we know there is a pressing need for travel to return to some kind of new normal as soon as is possible. And we also know that we cannot stay in fortress Guernsey or Fortress Bailiwick forever, um, or, or even just until uh, we have a vaccine, which of course may, may never emerge. We have to assume and we have to plan to restart travel on the basis that there is no vaccine, um, because of course, as a matter of fact, right now there isn't one. Obviously, we've got to balance the risk, having particular regard to the prevalence of uh, COVID-19 in, uh, in our near neighbours. And of course, we need to be aware that the UK is just about to introduce 
the same quarantine rules as us. And, and why are they doing that? Well, of course, they're doing it for exactly the same reasons as us, because they want to prevent new cases being imported uh, into the UK. So we are actively discussing how off-island travel can recommence safely. No decisions have yet been made, and I know that will fr be frustrating for some, but we have got to this point much faster than we could reasonably have expected only a few short weeks ago. And to keep the community safe, we do need to plan changes carefully and logically, which of course means concentrating our, our limited uh, resources on the most immediate problems, which right now is um, the move uh, into the next phase. As Dr Brink uh, can explain, there are flaws with many of the travel-related uh, measures which are in use elsewhere, whether it's temperature checks on arrivals, whether it's immunity certificates, uh, antibody tests that we've talked about so much in the last few weeks, or even full tests uh, when people arrive. If we need to put in additional measures and arrangements, we are confident that we will be able to do so. But the fact is, is that none of the measures currently available is, is perfect. So we're going to have to work out what is most appropriate, uh, what is the most appropriate mix, I guess, of, of measures um, for our community. And, and when we do, we will, of course, update Islanders as soon as we can. But I, I'm afraid I'm not going to put a timeline on that uh, today. In the meantime, we are in, of course, regular conversation with the air and sea carriers who have provided superb support to the bailiwick through this period. We're also keen to understand how other jurisdictions outside the British Isles uh, have been responding to the pandemic to share experiences and the learning um, that, that has been gained by us all uh, and to discuss exit strategies and the ways uh, of being able to safely up, open up travel to jurisdictions again, including, for example, the, the, the use of so-called um, air bridges, which have, have been in the media, in the national media, um, this last week or so. So it will be, I think, particularly useful for us um, to exchange experiences with, with other small island jurisdictions, such as the Faroe Islands, as well as larger ones like New Zealand um, that have followed a similar uh, strict uh, an early lockdown to Guernsey um, with, of course, the same test, trace and quarantine strategy. And, and we are actually seeking to establish dialogue with, uh, with both of them. Our colleagues in the Committee for Education, Sport and Culture have reviewed their previous decision, which was announced last week in light of the updated public uh, health position, which um, uh, Nikki will outline uh, shortly. The uh, committee um, are issuing a media release uh, today to explain that it met last night uh, to review the latest advice from both public health um, and their senior education staff and uh, has decided that states-run schools, all states-run schools, will reopen to all students five days a week from Monday the 8th of June, obviously with appropriate measures in place to safeguard the health and well-being of both students and staff. Uh, for clarity in terms of dates, of course, next week is half term and all schools will be closed. The following week, starting the 1st of June, uh, will uh, continue to be distance learning as schools will remain closed to, to all apart from uh, vulnerable uh, students and the children of essential workers, as has been the case up to now. Uh, and this will ensure that schools have in place all the necessary measures um, as advised by uh, pu public health by the 8th of June. Um, early years providers will uh, also be able to welcome all children back from the 1st of June, so a week earlier, provided um, that they have submitted their plans to do so to the state's um, early years team and, uh, and have had those approved. So I would encourage um, those providers to, to make contact with, with that team and, and uh, get engaged in that process. I, I'm aware that Deputy Fallows, the President of uh, the Committee for Education, Sport and Culture, will uh, be providing um, interviews later, uh, uh, later and further information uh, will be provided to parents next week in the form of a guidance document. So uh, that's enough from me. Um, Heidi. Thanks, Kevin. Now, last week I advised you all that because of the amazing work of the whole community, we could move fully to phase three, together with piloting the opening of a restricted class of businesses ahead of the introduction of phase four. Since then, as Deputy St Pierre has said, we have seen no new cases and the active cases have continued to fall to the extent that we expect to see them disappear very soon. There's no evidence of any community seeding. There is no one in the hospital with COVID-19. We are in a fantastic position. 
Because of this, the Committee for Health and Social Care agreed this week, based on advice from Dr Brink and the public health team, that we were in a position to move to phase four in our easing out of lockdown. Perhaps cantering out of lockdown is a better phrase given how things have been moving recently. Now this is quite a significant change which will require a lot of work before we can make it happen. My committee will need to agree revised directions which will be more than just tinkering at the edges with what we've currently got. Guidance will need to be produced for a range of businesses and organisations and the specific changes will need some clear communications for the whole community. It is for these reasons that we're proposing that we move to phase four from next Saturday, 30th of May. So I, we will still need to firm up details. I'd like to give you a flavour of what moving to phase four means. Businesses unable to operate fully or under social distancing guide restrictions in phase two and three will be permitted to operate under increased hygiene requirements. Such businesses may include elements of construction that require multiple individuals working in close proximity to form a task. All retail businesses, hairdressers and beauticians can reopen, subject to continued cleaning and hygiene requirements being in place. PPE will not be required. Restrictions on the numbers of people allowed in any premises will be necessary to comply with social distancing. Some business elements may be restricted if they present a particular risk. For example, changing rooms may be closed, fitting of clothes or activities that require physical contact will be restricted. Restaurants, hotels, cafes, beach kiosks and pubs serving food will be permitted to open with social distancing and hygiene requirements, both in public facing areas and kitchens. Restaurants will need to amend layouts of tables to ensure this can be achieved. There will be restrictions on standing at bars within restaurants in line with pre-lockdown restrictions, which do seem like a long time ago now. Where specialist contractors on the Baywick have to be used, there will be strict conditions put in place, which will include a legal requirement to only move between their place of work and a specified place of residence. Public venues, including sports grounds, churches and community centres, museums, theatres and cinemas may be permitted to open with restrictions on the size, nature and duration of activities. Non-contact sports and fitness training for other sports may recommence, including indoor activities. Gyms, fitness studios, swimming pools and health suites will be allowed to operate with additional hygiene requirements in place. Outdoor children's play areas can open, but not indoor play areas just yet. More people will be allowed to attend weddings and funerals subject, subject to social distancing and hygiene measures. Other gatherings will also be permitted, including congregational services, but again subject to a maximum number and social distancing and hygiene measures being put in place. And bubbles will be a thing of the past, with the only restrictions being that the size of gatherings, whether inside side or outside, will be limited. To give you an idea of what we mean by limited, we're looking at around 50 for weddings and funerals and around 30 for other gatherings. Travel for non-essential purposes will be permitted, but subject to those returning going into self-isolation for 14 days, as has already been the case for those essential visits. There'll be no requirements for businesses and organisations to register for phase four, but they will be expected to follow guidance relevant to their activities. And in, in addition to the above, there'll be concurrent changes to arrangements in the care homes with limited visits being allowed. More private health and wellbeing practitioners will be able to operate and new arrangements will be put in place in the hospital. So these are considerable changes with almost everything going back to a new normal, bar, pubs and clubs, contact sports and a few other things. However, and this is a really important point to make and follows on from what Deputy St Pierre said at the start, we will only be able to make these changes if things continue as they have been. That will require us all to continue to follow the current public health advice and in particular social distancing and hygiene guidance. Now is not the time for complacency. If we find that things go in the wrong direction across the next few days, we will re reconsider whether now is the time to make these changes. We're entering into the home straight. We don't want to fall at the last hurdle. We can and must get to the finishing line as quickly as possible, but only if we all continue to be Guernsey together. Right. Thank you very much, Holly. Nikki. Uh, thank you very much. And I have to say, I didn't think that I'd be sitting in front of you 
so quickly um, looking at progressing to phase four. We have exceeded our expectations. There's no doubt about that. We have no new cases for the 22nd consecutive day, We're still with only two active cases. So we're really in an extremely positive position. And I always go back on to basic principles and evidence, and looking at the World Health Organization, three criteria from a public health perspective that you need to ask yourself when you're easing out of lockdown. The first thing is you have to ask yourself, is your epidemic under control? And undoubtedly, our epidemic is under control. The second thing you have to ask yourself is, does your healthcare system have the capacity to cope with any resurgence of infection? And the answer to that is yes. And the third thing is, is do you have the appropriate public health surveillance to manage any cases that occur? And that relates to the test, track and trace, which I think I've said to you right from the beginning has been the absolute mainstay of our whole program. And we have that in place. Now, as we ease into phase four, or as Deputy Selby said, actually canter into phase four, is undoubtedly we're going to increase connectivity between people. And as we do that, we have to be aware that we might see the odd case coming up. Now, we would like to encourage anyone with symptoms to come forward and get tested. You know, someone said to me, I don't want to spoil your numbers. Well, no, 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 please come forward, um, get tested, because then if, it, if that person is positive, we can isolate them, we can contact trace around them, and we can nip any infections in the buds or any little clusters in the bud. So I think that's really important. So we fulfill those three World Health Organization public health criteria with ease. So linked to a lot of the activities that um, Deputy Soulsby mentioned are also some very personal activities that have come to us. So things like visiting, visiting in the hospital, that is going to be restarted and very defined circumstances. It's not going to be pre-pandemic visiting, but under defined circumstances, under arranged circumstances, um, we're looking to restart that. Another issue that's come up and people have asked us about is for partners to attend cesarean sections. We're looking at introducing that as well in phase four. The other issue is, is partners attending ultrasound scans. Again, those are coming in in phase four as well. So a lot of these issues that have been really concerning for people and has been, have been really hard for people, we're looking to, to introduce. So a lot of positive messages from that point of view. But again, what I want to stress is we're doing so well but we can't be complacent, is as we move in to phase four, and indeed as we go forward post-pandemic, a lot of those lessons of good hand hygiene, good respiratory etiquette, stay at home if you're unwell, are so, so important. I also wanted to touch on the issue of the care homes. So both care homes infections, we had outbreaks in two care homes, both outbreaks are completely resolved. And really, we'd like to thank everyone who've worked so hard on those. Primary care have worked incredibly hard with us, as have all the staff in the care homes. So I think that's really important from that point of view. And with that, visiting will restart, again, under very controlled circumstances in the care home. So it's not going to be like it was before, but at least people will be able to see their loved ones. And I think that's really important. The other thing that we're looking at with care homes is developing a testing program with them. So we've moved away from our testing symptomatic people only because, quite frankly, we've got so few symptomatic people now. And we've started our extending testing program early. So this week we've tested over 100 um, frontline key workers um, who don't have any symptoms at all, but we're testing them for presence of the virus. So what we're doing now is hunting out subclinical cases. And we're moving from our frontline key workers to work with other sectors across organizations. So, and care homes are, are one of the groups that we want to work with on that. And those discussions are ongoing now. And finally, I wanted to talk about education. You can recall when we closed the schools, we always said that we'd have to justify why we closed the schools, and indeed, we also have to justify why we keep the, the schools closed. From our point of view, on day 22, there's no public health justification to keep schools closed. And I'm really very well aware that a lot of parents are very keen to see their children back at school, but of course are concerned because a lot has happened. From a public health point of view, 
We've put all the measures in place that we can, working with education, so we've advised education on measures that we think are, are safe, as safe as possible. Now, of course, social distancing in schools, for those of you who are parents, is children are not going to social distance all the time. And what we want to stress is that social distancing, where possible, but what social distancing is part of is a suite of what we call non-pharmacological measures. So non-pharmacological measures include not only moving apart from each other, but other issues such as hand washing, such as um, catch a bin and kill it. Um, so all of those things. And the other important thing, and I was listening to the Chief Medical Officer, I dialed into a group with the Chief Medical Officer of England, and one of the important things is for people to stay at home if they're unwell. And that needs to be a recurring theme. If people are unwell, stay at home. Don't go into work. So I think what I'd like to conclude by saying is we're in a really good place. We're in a situation where, from a public health perspective, is we're happy for the schools to go back. We think it's as safe as possible. We're looking at a whole range of activities opening up. We went into lockdown early, and we were very proactive. And that has meant that we're sitting now with 22 days without infection. So now we're able to reap those rewards by opening up the bailiwick. We will, of course, be very proactive in trying to hunt out cases. And we will undoubtedly detect some cases. But from our perspective, I think we're in as good a position as we can be. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul. Yes, good afternoon. Payments of the business support have now moved over to the new automated system which is meaning a quicker turnover and turnaround time on applications. The majority of business support claims are now processed and the outstanding are being dealt with as quickly as possible. Payroll claims submitted for the period up to the 15th of May can be expected to receive notification of payment within the next week. Sub subsequent payroll submissions are anticipated to be paid much quicker with one week of, uh, within one week of submission once we have fully transitioned to the new system. Under the rules of the scheme, businesses who are open or able to open next week, but are still subject to a significant impact on turnover, are able to continue claiming. This support will continue to be available until at least the end of June. This will allow support to continue to be delivered to businesses as they transition out of lockdown and we are continuously assessing the requirements for business support beyond the June period. Throughout our response to the pandemic, we have used an online community monitoring tool where voluntary particip participants have fed back to us their causes for concern and where they needed support or indeed information. And in phase two of, that, of the COVID, where symptoms have been affecting them and how they've been responding to that. This has given us a really useful insight across the community. Unsurprisingly, we do have an increase on unemployment figures. Next, next week, we will launch phase three of our community monitoring, where we will be asking participants to let us know about their employment status so that we can track our emergence out of lockdown and our progress to recovery. Deputy St. Pierre has commented on travel to and from the bailiwick, and indeed, we are working hard on multiple options to restart travel options when the circumstances allow us to do so. However, with borders currently closed, we're conscious business and specifically our tourism sector is very severely impacted. Visit Guernsey have set up a tourism task force with industry looking to the 2021 season and for this year, developing a staycation campaign, which we'll, we'll inform you about shortly, to encourage all of us to make the most of offering we have right here on our own doorstep. During the unprecedented period of the COVID-19 lockdown, many public services have been delivered by staff, as you know, working remotely. Our community has been assessing, accessing public services differently, and our staff have been working uh, in different ways in order to provide a level of service. Like the private sector, we are now working to bring staff back into our offices in a safe and regulated way with appropriate safe distancing and, of course, increased hygiene measures. That said, like many others, we'll be taking positives from the adaptions and progressions we have made over the last couple of months and will not be returning to provide previous ways of working where improvements to our efficiencies and our systems can be made. It's important we use this opportunity to adopt 
new, modern and collaborative working processes where they are lacking and that will allow the community to increasingly access services, access services via a digital platform. Meanwhile, our services are continuing. Increasingly, they are happening in the normal way or the new normal. For example, the revenue services will be issuing interim tax assessments to any customers that receive income in 2020 which does not have tax deducted at source. This may include business or rental income, bank interest or old age pension, but we know there are, that we aren't yet in normal times and many people have seen changes to their income, significant changes in some cases. So as part of this interim, interim tax assessment, we'll be providing online forms for people to let us know how their situation has changed and for those who need, next, need extra help, we will support them with payment plans too which can also be requested via our website. The regulated return to work will allow us to use our extensive estate more effectively, reducing the number of buildings we occupy and reducing the cost of run running the public sector. As previously noted, we cannot rule out that the virus will return and lockdown measures being reintroduced. The regulated return to work allows us to mitigate risk and ensure delivery of our core functions are ma maintained seamlessly. Lastly, we are allowed to justifiably be proud of our community response and jubilant that this has brought us to the positive place we find ourselves today. We can now really focus on recovery in the knowledge that if and possibly when cases of the virus return, our robust and efficient track, trace and test processes perfected over the last few months will ensure that we control and manage the situation effectively. We have successfully responded to this pandemic as Guernsey together. We must respond to our recovery in the same way. We have every faith. We have, we have mentioned so far staycations and the planned opening up of local retail. On per online purchases have often been the only option. Now is the time to support your local businesses where you can. Let's not forget how unbeatable we are when we all pull together. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, Dr Bishop. Thank you. Uh, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week, uh, a time when we should be particularly aware of our own well-being and that of those around us. It also falls during a time of considerable and arguably unprecedented stress, when all life certainties which usually keep us grounded and feeling safe feel very fragile and far away. In these circumstances, is it really enough for just one week out of 52 for us to be mental health aware? The theme of mental health awareness this week is kindness, sorry, this year is kindness, which seems incredibly basic, and yet, if you think about it carefully, is terribly important. Because what is a community other than a group of people being kind and supportive to each other when they're going through a difficult time? And I believe that the Bailiwick of Guernsey, including all the islands therein, is a truly kind community. Firstly, we need to be kind to ourselves. Consider what in our lives is positive, which we can do more of, and what is less so, which should be minimised. By our nature, we are social beings and need human connection. Talk to people, especially if you are struggling. You will find that talking about your problems, even if the person you're talking to doesn't have the solution, will be helpful. Seek out people who you know are positive for you, and that's incredibly important. If you're worried about the virus, as many people are, Find out the facts from a reliable source. Listen to the on-island experts. Don't overexpose yourself. Try and avoid watching hours of television and searching the internet. It's not helpful and it's not healthy. Do the things that you know are generally good for your physical health, as these will help with your well-being. Make sure you're sleeping. Eat well. Watch your alcohol intake and ensure you get some exercise. Many people have said to me that in lockdown, down, all the days merge into one, especially for those who are furloughed or working or schooling at home. Make sure that you have meaningful, positive structure to your days and be clear with yourself when you're working or at school and when is your downtime. And during that downtime, do the things you know that you would enjoy in normal times. Then there are people around us who we care about. We should always be kind to them but we know that sometimes we're not. We should try to do better. Then there are the strangers. Kindness to them and from them is perhaps the most important and most touching. Being kind to ourselves and to others, 
makes us feel good about ourselves as well as having a positive impact on those around us. Being unpleasant or unkind, whether or not it's in, pers in person or on social media, is unhelpful, it's unhealthy and it's toxic to all parties. The Bailiwick of Guernsey is a cohesive and kind community and I know that many of our staff have been incredibly touched by the tined, kind gestures towards them. The weekly clap, the gifts to the hospital, but, ha but perhaps the most touching is when patients we speak to who are struggling the most pause and ask us how we are. As you've heard from the panel, we are now entering a new phase in the management of this pandemic and people are responding in different ways, all of which are valid and understandable and all of which may need support. Some are keen to move forward as quickly as possible and get back to normal. Some want to move slower than the recommended rate and some want to pause completely until there is no risk whatsoever. But there is no life without risk and if we try to avoid all negatives, we will prevent any possibility of positives. In terms of an update from the mental health services across the island, although there was a reduction in the first month um, as is seen with every medical specialty. Over the last few weeks, there has been a significant increase in the number of people referred to all parts of our service. These, reserve, these referrals are not all COVID virus specific, but many of them have a link with the current situation. There are many indirect effects of the pandemic, and we need to consider all of those. And they include social isolation, unemployment, financial concerns, increased stress on relationships and all of these negatively impact our well-being. <clears throat> our inpatient wards are very busy at the moment and people are acutely unwell but they are not overwhelmed. We hope that as lockdown eases not only will the stress on the population decrease but we will also be able to open all parts of our service to cater for the current need. However the return to normal just like with the normal population will be a challenge to our service um, and the staff within these services will need support to manage this transition. Like many other states departments and businesses in the private sector, the return to normal will be complicated and the phrase new normal may well apply. We will be looking at the potential lessons we have learnt over the last few weeks and months, what has gone well and what could be the positive outcomes in terms of changing our service as we move forward. We know that there won't be extra money moving forward and we all have a responsibility to use the resources in the most effective and efficient way considering the demand for all our services may increase over the coming months. From the recent well-being survey um, many people especially the over 50s have identified that there have been some marked positives in the new ways of working and the new ways um, that their lifestyles have evolved. Many really have really valued the increased time with their families and a flexible way of working and we would encourage those who have found positives over the last few months to approach their employer and see if these can be sustained. Perhaps during this time, every week should be Mental Health Awareness Week, and I think we should all consider that. And maybe kindness should be compulsory, but then it would have less meaning. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tom. Um, actually, just picking up on your comment about kind gestures, actually, is a good opportunity. We were just talking about it before we came down, about the... A uh, number of cards and, and, and gifts and so on, that have, little small gifts that have been sent in to all of us, some of which we've, we're wearing. And, and um, I mean, I know it's, 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 it's impacted the whole of health and social care team, but, but also those of us who are you know, the face of this here today. And so it's an opportunity to say thank you to, for all of those. I, I did want to single out one, actually, which was Kobe, um, aged 11, from Amherst Primary. He, he sent us a, uh, a Woodcraft um, uh, that he's making, and but importantly, he's selling them for char for a different charity every each time. So, so thank you to Kobe. So, thank you for that. The one question I just wanted to address, probably to both um, Heidi and Nikki, um, before we go into the questions, was just the, the it, when we go into phase four, um, the advice will still be that if you can work at home, then just picking up again on Dom's point, that if you can work at home, um, continue to do so. And that, and that, yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you can work at home, continue to work at home, but otherwise um, it's, it's fine to go back to work. So it's really important. I mean, 
Um, as we, we move into this phase, we're still cognizant of some people, for example, those that are shielding, that may not be able to go back to work. Mm. So um, there are specific groups that we are aware of. And I'd encourage those, those individuals in those groups to discuss it with their manager um, or with their, their GP and get the, the appropriate help and support. But yes, you know, um, work at home if you can. But otherwise, um, it's um, go back to work. Great. OK, let's open up to questions. Who wants to go? Ewan first. Uh, Ewan Duncan from BBC Guernsey. Just so I can clarify, just so we're all sure, because I don't think it was exactly obvious, but what you said is we're removing bubbles up to a maximum of 30 people, except for weddings or funerals, so that's 50 people, and you can now travel off-island, even if it's non-essential, but you will have to self-isolate for 14 days. That's correct. Got it bang on there. Yeah, Thank you very great. much. It must have been very clear. I'm, I'm glad I was listening. I don't think it was quite clear for maybe everyone listening at home, but um, just an, another it's question I can time. ask about um, care homes and hospitals visiting. You've talked about that in a controlled way. Yes. Ha, what is a controlled way? So we're working on the protocols at the moment, so this is not the absolute what will happen, but it'll be a booked time, it'll be limiting the number of people, it'll be subject to good um, hand hygiene, good hygienic precautions. Um, we're very keen to get people back together. We understand how difficult it's been. Um, myself and Dr. Raby have had lots of emails also from um, mums-to-be, so a pregnant woman, who would like to see their partner at, for example, if they have a plan for their section. So all of those things we're very aware of. So we're trying to work through all of those protocols. Now, phase four, we anticipate going in at the end of next week. So over this week is we're going to be working to sort out all of those, all of those protocols. Um, and that will include also hospital visiting as well. So it might be, it will be hospital visiting in a slightly different way, but it's the first steps to getting us back into into um, people seeing seeing their relatives that are in hospital, in care homes, or partners accompanying their um, partner to an ultrasound scan or um, to a caesarean section. Okay, very much. Rosie, also Island FM. Um, can you explain for the for the school children who are listening what school's going to be like? Will it be exactly the same as before? Will it be very very different? How's it going to be when they return to school? So education, I'm going to be talking in, in more detail about that, and it, it will be slightly different, but, um, and there will be a focus on, on hand hygiene, um, you know, respiratory etiquette, so there'll be a focus on all of that. Um, there won't be, um, the, in the first instance, any extracurricular activities and so on. So education will be producing a lot of detail on that. So um, all the core subjects will be, um, will be going ahead, but with not some of the um, the added um, the added components, um, but they'll be doing that in a lot of detail for you. Okay, thanks, Rosie. From ITV Channel, with the off island travel, you said you're in conversations with our Orini and, and Condor. Does that mean from the 30th of June, from then on, they could put more services on to travel out, or is it still going to be relying on the lifeline services that already exist? At the moment, at the moment, it's, it's the lifeline services. In, in, in in terms of we're maintaining an open dialogue, but absolutely no decisions have been been taken at this stage in relation to the resumption of a normal commercial passenger or a normal commercial passenger ferry service. So that, that as I said earlier, that, that, that we recognise very much that that is one of our next challenges, um, and we do need to devote the time to to, to, to make those decisions with with considerable care. Um, and there is a lot to think about. Not, but an emphasis really being on understanding the the risk and how we can mitigate it. That really is at the heart of what we need to do. Yeah, I mean, we have been looking at, it, looking at it and thinking about it. And now that we've got going to a new normal, as it were, um, in the Berwick, we can really focus on, on what we can do. And, and I think Nikki makes a really good point. I mean, Gavin made very good points about you hear a lot about um, what you can do at the airports and temperature checks and stuff like that. And a lot of it, well, we, we mention we say these things a lot to Dr. Brink and say, you know, well, they're doing this here and they're, they're doing temperature checks there and they're going to be testing people when they come in here. But then a lot of and Dr. Brink says, yeah, but they don't really tell you very much. They don't, they kind of give you a selfish, um, and a, a wrong assurance there that you 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 think you could, you you're free from the virus, but that that is not necessarily the case. Mm. I don't know. Nikki, yeah. what's the same I, I think that's that's absolutely the case. There's 
there is no magic um, process that we could put into place to say, well, things are going to be safe. What is of considerable interest to us is that the UK are going to be um, bringing in a compulsory quarantine period. And on top of that, they are moving to a community test, trace and track system. So I think you're going to see quite a profound effect on community transmission within England over the next couple of months. And that would obviously be of considerable interest to us. With regard to the individual interventions at the airport, and I think I've said this to all of you today, we could technically, we could go and um, test people at the airport as they came in. But if they were negative today, it wouldn't mean that they were negative the next day. They could be positive that afternoon. So you've got to be really clear. And I've always said we have to be honest and transparent in what we're doing and honest with the population saying, well, if we tested it, yeah, okay, it'll be a risk reduction because you're not positive today, but it doesn't mean that you're not positive tomorrow. So I think we've got to be very, very careful with that. A lot has been brought in or been discussed about these very rapid tests. Well, I think you all know that we've got two molecular tests or two direct virus detection tests on the island. The one is our test, our conventional test that takes us about four hours to do. The other is our rapid test, which takes us just under an hour to do. So, for example, if we send a patient out to Southampton on an emergency flight, we have to do a COVID test on them before they go. We can do that in under an hour. So while they're preparing the flight, we're doing the COVID test at the same time. So um, we've got all of those in place at the moment. So if we have an emergency case where we, it's the middle of the night and we really would like a rapid diagnosis, we have the ability to do that within an hour 24-7. So a lot of those systems we've already got in place, but we've got to think about everything we do, what does it mean, and are we confident that the result is giving us that information that we need? So I don't, has that answered your question? I was just going to, not to say that I'm going to clarify, because obviously you guys are the experts, but just, I guess, to clarify on the live stream, at the moment the rules are for the UK, if you're in the bailiwick, because we're in the tra common travel area, although there are restrictions now going into the UK, if you were to go into the UK right now, you would not have to self-isolate for 14 days. Co and correct, yes, yeah. and that, yeah. that's our expectation. Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason for that. But change. I think the point Nikki was making was the fact that they are bringing quarantine into that there is, that it will be that border, that, that barrier that we've done, yeah. will minimise that risk of it coming out, so that, that helps us. Yeah. Yeah. Provides an additional level, it can provide a bubble for us yeah. potentially. But yeah. the important point is, is we need to see that working, yeah. and we yeah. need to see the prevalence of community transmission falling mm. In, mm. in particularly those places where we are most likely to be travelling as a community. Yeah. It would be perverse for us mm. to be removing the very thing that the UK is just about to introduce mm. um, when it's been so effective for us in the last two months. Mm. So, uh, you know, it um, would be you know, essentially premature at yeah. that point. Next Absolutely. question, Aaron. Aaron Carbon to Bellow Express. Um, on the subject of travel and heading into the summer, um, what's your current thinking regarding travel between the islands of the Bailiwick? Uh, between the islands of the Bailiwick? Yeah. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. Uh, I think there's there's certainly a plan to to look at at how that can be uh, can be introduced and, and enhanced. So I think that's a planning. I think the discussions are very early. Again, we've progressed far quicker than we thought we would and but I would anticipate that we would see some travel between the islands but obviously that's dependent for all the islands to discuss together and we can actually we're planning to bring you back more information on that next week also it's, worth, it, it's worth noting that that Sark have, have still maintained their closed borders in Sark so it's not a case of us just moving freely between uh, each of the islands. I think there's a case to, to consider uh, the, the different place each of the islands are in with the bailiwick, but we are working and, and talking with Sark, Herm and Alderney on almost a day-to-day a -day basis. Great, thank you very much. Um, Danielle Keely, Go Press. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that was mentioned um, about there's, there's a potential concern that islanders uh, are not wanting to get tested for coronavirus as they're worried that if they do and they become the new case, then we'll go back a phase, possibly. Yeah. Um, how many cases would you need to see for us to go back a phase? And, or, or would it be more to do with untraceable communities? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, from my point of view, is that I would absolutely encourage people to come forward um, for testing. And if we do get a single case, we wouldn't be going back 
for. Obviously, if we started seeing increasing numbers and clusters and so on, it would have to be um, far more than a, a single case. From our point of view, we also are looking at a situation if someone has got COVID-19, is we don't want the onward transmission to occur because that could then, if we started getting uncontrolled transmission, that could put us back. But individual cases is we have a very sophisticated track and trace system in place now. And when we looked at, for example, the number of 30, which we put for gatherings, we back calculated what we thought we could manage if we saw a case with our track and trace. And I think that's really important. So I would say to Islanders, if you think you've got symptoms, please do come forward. Um, let us test you. Then we can put the appropriate mitigation in place to prevent that onward transmission. This is not a blame game. If someone comes forward and tests positive, they're actually doing the right thing for the community. So we would, we would welcome and applaud them coming forward to be tested so that we could put the appropriate measures in place to prevent onward transmission. So I would really implore people, if they do think they have symptoms, come forward and be tested. Yeah, and nobody should be worried about wasting yeah. time or wasting Never. resources. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely mm -hmm. critical that people yeah. take it very seriously. Next question. Ewan. We've spoken in the past about what the tourism season might look like. Now, with the indication that non-essential travel is allowed, what could that season look like, bearing in mind that still people coming into our borders will have to self-isolate for two weeks? I think the reality is inbound, at the moment, inbound um, to, tourists uh, is going to be limited by that for that very reason, because self-isolation, as we've talked about before, isn't just a question of staying at home and staying um, you know, away from circulating with others. It's, it's a much stricter requirement than that. Um, and so I think the reality is is that and, and, and until the point where we are comfortable um, with a, a different regime, I, I think it, that is going to be a very practical impediment for most people. And indeed, it, for those going off island, those thinking about taking a holiday elsewhere, of course, they also will need to factor the, the fact that they are, at the moment will be expected to, to self-isolate, or they will be required, I should say, to, to, to self-isolate on their return. And that will be quite off-putting as well, I suspect. So, you know, the, the reality is, um, I suspect most people, although non-essential travel is permitted, um, it's not terribly attractive um, with that with that requirement to self-isolate on return. Um, and what kind of damage do you think that could do to the economy in Guernsey and also in Alderney and Sark and Herm, who rely heavily on tourism? I, I mean, clearly, the, the the impact on on the hospitality and visitor economy is significant. We know that, and, and that you know, significant amount of damage has, has already been done. The 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 priority, as we've said all along, is to restart the economy as quickly as we can, but, as, but the proviso, the very important caveat, is as safely as we can. And, and the hospitality sector is no different. So we've taken the, the, the decisions of, of, uh, in principle in relation to phase four for being able to re restart some of the hospitality, albeit with social, social distancing. Um, it's not going to be a full, uh, um, uh, they won't be able to do everything they were able to do before. So, so you know, f for those businesses, it's going to, it's, um, they're going to continue to suffer um, uh, and, until such time as, as those restrictions can be relaxed a bit further, even, even in phase four. So, um, it, you know, we, uh, we are aware of all of these challenges, um, but there is the, the, there is a limit to what can be done um, safely, and that's that's it's the key all priority. About looking at the balance, and uh, the, um, sadly, the tourist industry will be impacted by it. But by having that, imposing those controls on the border, has meant we're being able to open up the rest of the economy yep. much faster. And I mean, it's difficult. We can't do everything, but that it is that that's kind of. A, the, the one sacrifice we've had to make so the rest of the economy can keep going. Yeah, Paul? Yeah, but, but as I mentioned earlier on uh, in, in my statement, that um, Committee for Economic Development and Visit Guernsey are working. A specific task force has been set up to actually see how you can stimulate, how can we promote Guernsey is a really good branded place to come to, particularly 2021 is going to look differently. And what a great place to come to if we can get that, that, that movement going by then. And also, what can we do on our own doorstep? There is going to be a campaign which we'll be uh, announcing very shortly about staycations and using, uh, hopefully, our accommodation uh, in a different way in Guernsey. And also that links into 
things like using uh, uh, hotel kitchens in a different way and providing mm -hmm. meals. So it, it's not completely closed down and we're working very hard to see how innovative we can be in the short term. Um, Sorry, but in all fairness to that, on island travel in within the bailiwick i'm sorry that if you're on island in guernsey are you going to stay in a four-star hotel for a week it's not going to be the same this year and there will be businesses who don't make it to 2021 absolutely yeah, but part of it i mean although we have um uh, closed our borders and have got that 14 day self-isolation we've really just got to look at what's happening elsewhere in the world people aren't going to be moving the airline, airlines aren't moving People are being in the UK know that they're going to be in quarantine when they come back. How many of them want to move? So I think we need to look at it and say, well, what, whatever we do, that movement is not going to be out there. Absolutely. In the meantime, what we're saying, we're not just shrugging our shoulders, including with Indrisi and saying, what can we do together? And it isn't perfect, but also how can they utilise, you know, uh, very good staff that they want to keep hold of? How could they use them in a different way? in order to support an industry that could be stood up when it actually needs to be. So yeah, there is a lot of thinking, but it's not easy. Um, no, I'm I'm what, what sort I'm of long-term states backing can that industry expect? The, those decisions have not been taken. I and mean, that all form part of the recovery plan. Mm, absolutely. And, and we will, you know, as with so much, we're going to have to reimagine uh, what, you know, what, mm. what is the role of the hospitality in the visitor economy going to be? Is it going to be twice the proportion of... of the economy than it is now, um, because people generally are, are not going to want to travel as far as they once once did, and and with you know climate changes as well in, in affecting people's desire to travel great distances is another factor, or is it going to be much smaller because for the almost for the same set of reasons? So I think those are the challenges. Those are the things that we're going to have to work through. We don't have the answers to those questions now. Yeah, Rosie. Um, we know that the state schools will be able to reopen. What's happening with the colleges, uh, Elizabeth College yeah. and Ladies College well, in Blanchland? Yes, um, I, I know the independent schools will be making announcements in terms of contacting parents now that they know the general announcements. They've made their own decisions. They've been making their own plans uh, to ready and open, open the colleges, uh, and they will be contacting the parents directly. Okay, thank you. Daniel? Um, earlier this week, the state said it, if it were to listen border controls, it would need to consider other jurisdictions situation and their controls. Um, has the states looked at options for reducing restrictions for places with strong border controls and low numbers of cases like Germany or Latvia? Yeah, I mean that's very much that, that that's very much really what we're talking about is, is actually you know thinking about to the extent that we can restart travel, how who who can we do it with and how can we do it? Um, so, but again, in terms of decisions, have decisions been made? No, the decisions have not been made yet. Um, but it's 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 those are some of the options that, that um, the so-called air bridges to take take you from one lo um, low prevalence jurisdiction to another. Mickey, did you want to comment further? No, I, I think that's absolutely looking at the community prevalence in various jurisdictions and having flight bridges is a very attractive option. Yep. No, 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 I think it makes absolute sense. Right. Can I ask where support Charlie. groups fit into phase four? So, for instance, antenatal classes or new mums groups, if they're a group of people that aren't in a shielding or a vulnerable category and they're meeting in less than 30, what's the thought with support groups? So I think as long as they can adhere to the standards of hygiene. So what we're doing is we're setting out a set of principles. So rather than look at each individual group, because there's so many groups, we're saying, these are the principles for a group to gather together. So can you socially distance? Um, are there hand hygiene? You know, are there hand washing facilities? Are there toilets that are cleaned regularly? I mean, I'm sorry, it sounds very basic, but all of those things. And, and so it'd be fulfilling the set of criteria. Um, we wouldn't want people to attend these if they were feeling ill or if their child was ill, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's adhering to that set of standards. So rather than be too prescriptive about, well, we can do this activity, you can't do that activity, one of the things we haven't looked at in phase four is some of the extracurricular activities. Um, so with the schools, you'll hear more sort of focused on core activities. And when you get to extracurricular activities out of, um, out of school, um, you know, sort of like woodwind instruments and things like that, um, those are going to be specifically considered in phase five. But a lot of those other activities, it's going to be, can you adhere to these standards? And if you can, then go ahead. Yeah. 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, go to Rosie again. Will you be opening the bring banks soon for recycling? Bring banks, anyone know the answer to that? Do we know the answer to that or not? Yeah, uh, no, but sorry. We can find out. Yeah, well, sorry, don't know the answer to that one. Do you want to do another one? Is it was such a quick one? No, then? no, no, Daniel? that's fine. I'm good. Um, I wanted you. to ask you to clarify what health and social care's um, deal is with Queen's Road, Queen's Road Medical Practice. Um, why has this primary care um, place been chosen over the others? And how much the deal is with them? And also, what does this mean for Islanders? Okay, well, not, not all that relates to um, COVID-19 and uh, the purpose of the press conference. I'm, we can give you more information on that, that afterwards. We um, have been in discussions with all the medical practices who, I have to say, have been absolutely fantastic during this whole crisis. I and mean, they've had a big part to play, huge part to play, along with the care homes, in really mitigating our risk. So really, what the, the purpose has been is to formulate our, our arrangements with the medical practices, we have come and got in. We have already signed, as I've said previously, um, agreement with um, Queen's Road Medical Practice, um, and as a result of that, there will be reductions in costs of uh, telephone consult consultations and reduced costs for um, repeat prescriptions. But also, that that contract covers off what we want to do for the future uh, for the new model of care. At the moment we've been uh, debating in the States about the electronic patient record. Well that's one area that we will see really close working with um, Queen's Road in terms of being able to have that sharing of information and really being provide that joined up care that people don't see. This is uh, the key to what the partnership purpose is about, that joined up patient centred care. People don't have to restate what they've said to somebody else. It's uh, that one, one version of the truth that which, which practitioners um, can, uh, can, can access. We, we're still in discussions with the other two practices and we'll be able to give you more information on that next week. Thank you, Ian. Uh, just, a, just a quick one about um, how the policing of these new measures will uh, go about. Obviously, Rudy Hardy's not here today, so he can give us that. But in terms of the bars and the restaurants and, and how they're going to operate, especially within staff that are working there, um, how will this be policed in effect? I suspect mm. they will police it in the same way that they did before we went into to the full lockdown. Mm. And uh, I think we found when we, we did that that there was only one real incident that happened. Because people have just really followed and been a, worked as a community, and it's really a shame, uh, Bailwick and, and, and Guernsey, that, that the fantastic community that we have, who people have complied, they've listened, listening to Dr. Brink and the reasoning why we, we're making the decisions we have, people have followed it, and that's that's what I suspect will, will happen now. But the police will do as the police have done already. I think the other thing to add is that there will be um, environmental health will do some spot checks as well, on, but I think. Um, picking up on Heidi's point, I think the reality is also because the community um, have very much bought into the need for all of this, um, actually if, if a business is, is failing to, to do that which is expected of it, they're not going to be very successful because people just won't be comfortable going there. And I think that, that's the reality is that, and you've seen, I think we've seen that already for those businesses that have been able to open. That is the public expectation and business need to respond to that if they're going to have any, any business at all. Um, yes, sorry, Rosie. This is a question from someone who's watching on the live feed at the moment. They've said, um, can you please ask why restrictions to recreation time and removing bubbles can't start from today? We need to um, look at all the new directions. All, the, all those, uh, the guidance uh, and, and the instructions we've given in, in, in that regard all set out in directions made by the committee. And that's what I said in part of my uh, speech. There are lots of changes we've got to make. It, we need to um, seek the advice of Her Majesty's Procureur and Controller and really ensure that we've got what we got it right. It's not like, as I said before, earlier, tinkering at the edges. This is going to be a fundamental change to the directions we give. And also we, we think it's important that we can get messages out because if things are going to change. There are elements that will be different. And so we want to make sure that we get that communication right. So we've done throughout all this is making sure that people understand we're clear and transparent in what we're doing. So we, the important thing it was to give that heads up so people knew it was coming, which is great, but also give, give the business, businesses time to adapt because we're conscious these are a lot of changes, a lot of businesses are going to be involved here and other organisations and we need the time, um, uh, Paul's um, staff and team need to really get working, I mean, they're going to have a lot of work to do to support us in producing all the guidance for everybody. 
So yeah, it's just also listening to the community. So um, one of the things, and I have to say, I have to pay tribute to the hairdressers because I think a lot of us are missing the hairdresser. Um, but um, from that perspective is they've put some really, really um, good emails into public health explaining how, you know, what they can do and so on. But one of the things they did say to us is please give us a week's notice so that we can get everything organised. So again, it's trying to respect what the community tells us when we're going to do a change because a lot of people if we said next friday you can open tomorrow that's it. my goodness you know i'm not you know i need to prepare myself so it's listening to what people are telling us and what they require from us when we change from face to face but specifically in relation to the, the, the social um changes which uh, the question asked again going but i think you did address this when you you opened nikki actually from a public health perspective you do want that 14 day yeah. period from the last change to see yeah. what the impact has been so it is it yes. is important that people yeah. do continue to respect the bubbles yeah. for the next seven days yes and by the next uh, by next week we all things being equal hopefully will be 28 days which is twice the maximum generational cycle so the incubation period is between two and 14 days so it's giving us more and more confidence so that's that's yeah. absolutely true Charlotte. Thank you. i was just going to follow up um, um, Dr. Brink's comments last week about looking towards elimination. Um, am I right in thinking you said that it was 28 days from the last confirmed new case? We're on day 22 now. Are, we, are you still following that as your, as your guide? So we're working with, a, with an academic institution to look at exactly what, how we should define elimination. So at the moment we too have two active cases on the island. So both of those people are in quarantine and pose no risk of onward transmission. But the academic argument is whether we use the last new case or whether we, use, we count from the last active case being resolved. And there isn't a general worldwide definition. So we're having these discussions. I, I think it's, it's as much of interest academically. Um, I think from our perspective is um, being, having no cases in the community that we can detect. And all our intelligence indicates that we believe that the, the 22 days of no cases, um, the primary care are not reporting any untoward activity. We've got no cases um, in the hospital. We've had no excess death, well, no deaths related to COVID. So we've you know, all of our, all of the data is, is stacking together. So there's nothing that's sticking out and making us thinking, oh my goodness, we're worried about that. Um, so I think from our perspective, we've, we're fairly confident with that. Can I just add to that? Because um, I think they, there's been some rumors or people talking about try, having an elimina elimination strategy, but that was never our strategy. And we, we, at the very beginning of this, we never said that that would be a strategy, that we would always expect to have cases. It's just that the community have been so fantastic and, and, and supported us in all the measures that we've taken. It's been a, just a fantastic byproduct that we might actually be able to get there. But opening up um, and what we're doing now, we might see more cases. So it should not be seen as failure yeah. because we're never aiming for elimination. It's just the community's done a fantastic job. Okay, Daniel. Um, I, I know Mr. Whitfield mentioned unemployment in, in your opening speech, but I want to know how many people are actually unemployed in the island, and how how has this changed since since coronavirus? Yeah, I think the latter part is more relevant, and I think um, at the minute we've got um, a technical glitch in the system that normally counts just the pure figure. Uh, of unemployed, but we are able to monitor that and the change of that by uh, the way benefits are, are claimed. Um, and we have some 400 in the two month period um, additional claims paid uh, through unemployment um, benefit, but the cost of that has risen by about 310%. But I think we should co concentrate on the fact that obviously unemployment figures, normally we enjoy incredibly low figures. So you can see that. That, that leap is, is, is very telling, but definitely uh, the numbers, particularly over the first part of the uh, COVID, uh, went up very dramatically. Um, but we're now actually seeing a tail off of that um, as the restrictions have eased up and, and particularly businesses have started to reopen. Uh, the, those figures have dropped slightly in terms of the numbers claiming. Okay, time for one more question. Sorry, Daniel. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. What was the unemployment figures before? I know you said it's jumped by 400, but what was it initially? Yeah, it was about it was about the um, it was about half of that figure, and it's it it, it it's doubled in that amount at the moment. But um, as we say, we we are pleased to see that tailing off. But I think 
What is more material is the long-term impact. We've been talking about the tourism and the impact of that sector. That's, that's what we've got to really work with. Okay, we have one final question. Anyone? Sorry, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, we've seen a number of milestones um, in the exit strategy in recent weeks. Um, you did, however, Deputy St. Pierre, open this briefing with a note of caution mm. um, about WHO statistics and the worldwide situation. Um, are you still apprehensive about the possibility of a second wave? Um, it's probably a question that's probably better directed to, to, the, to the experts than to me, but, but certainly um, I, everything, our, the strategy is predicated on, on an assumption that there is that risk. Uh, and therefore, um, just because we are in a very good place now as a, as a jurisdiction and, and within our own bailiwick bubble um, does not mean that we can um, be complacent about what's going on outside. And that, that is in, informing our, our, really our thinking. Um, so wh whether it's a form of a, a imp importation from the first wave or whether it's worrying about the second or a third wave, in a sense, it's the same challenge. That would be my reaction, but you, yeah. you're, yours absolutely. is far better informed. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've always got to be cognizant of a second wave. And whilst we progress through the, the phases, we've also started thinking about how we would manage a second wave should it occur. You know, if a, another case was imported or something bubbled up in the community, um, how we'd manage a second wave. We're also looking forward to the, looking forward as in, looking into the future for the um, winter season and looking at how we manage our diagnostic capabilities for influenza alongside any COVID activity. So we're forward planning um, towards um, for the end of the year and for the winter flu season. And that's part of our um, part of what we do is we, we look at what we can do to get a situation under control, look at what the risks of the resurgence are and how we look forward into the future, what our activity might need to be over the next six, eight months. We're keeping stocks, PPE, make, yep. just ready in case that there is a second wave. Great. Well, thank you very much. Just before we, we uh, go, just a couple of final messages from me. Um, it's an opportunity once again to thank people for their generosity in, in response to the appeals. Um, the uh, COVID-19 response appeal is stands, currently stands 127,000 and the social um, investment uh, fund stands at 145,000, although I think there is more in the pipeline coming into that one as well. So just a staggering generosity from the community. So thank you very much for that. Um, and then really the final message is really re echoing, the, the importantly, Yes, there is a pre-announcement of um, the intention to move into phase four, subject to uh, the decision, the formal decision being made next week. Um, so we are still in phase three, so it is important that people do continue to adhere to, uh, to phase three, uh, particularly to social distancing that we, that we emphasized earlier. That, that is going to be a very key um, requirement for us all for some, some period of time. Um, and so I just ask that people do keep that in mind, particularly going into a bank holiday weekend. Uh, and of course, re-emphasising once again, it's we can't can't be done enough, can it, Nikki? In terms of the personal hygiene messages, um, as we all starting to go out of our households much more, we mustn't forget that discipline that we all learnt quite early on in the process. Uh, we've got to go back to making sure we are very disciplined about that personal hygiene. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next Friday.